Welcome to We the People. My name is Joan Higginbotham, and I'll be your host for this evening's program, brought to you by the League of Women Voters of Minneapolis. Minneapolis has a reputation of being one of the most sustainable cities in the nation. It's a reputation that they've gained through a lot of hard work and good planning. And we're going to talk tonight about some of the initiatives that they've conducted to make us such a sustainable place and what they're doing to continue our reputation as the most sustainable big city. Our guests this evening are Gail Press, and Gail is the Director of Minneapolis Sustainability Office. Welcome. Thank you. And our other guest this evening is Robin Garwood, and he is a policy aide to Second Ward Council Member Cam Gordon. That's Welcome. Right. Thank you. And I know that Mr. Gordon has been very well known in the city for his work on sustainability issues, so mm -hmm. you're a logical person for us to have with us tonight. Thanks. Well, you know, I said to you before we did this that, that there were some questions when I said this was our topic about exactly what is sustainability. And then as I started preparing, it sounded to me like it could be almost anything under the sun. So tell us what it is. Well, to me, sustainability is the, the idea that a permanent human culture or a, or a long-term human culture is, is possible and that it is the right thing to do and, the, and a possible thing to do to build that kind of a culture, but that some of the systems that we've built so far uh, are not going to get us there. Um, and it's intimately tied up with uh, how we interact with the ecology on which we depend, uh, but it's also about how we interact with each other. Um, so a, a sustainable society would also have equitable um, distribution of the resources that, that the society creates. So it, we wouldn't be extracting so much from the earth and we wouldn't be putting so much waste back on the earth. We would be sort of putting ourselves into um, the ecological systems rather than trying to live kind of on top of them. So we could sustain ourselves for a longer period of time if yes. we did this. Seven well, generations has, or more. Has, has Robin taken the whole field from you there, Gail? Heck no. You know, I mean, for me, it's about whenever we make a decision, thinking about the long-term implications. Mm -hmm. What are the implications on our grandkids, our great-grandkids? And how does it affect not just our grandkids, but all the people in the community? I think everybody wants to live in a community that's thriving and that has a positive future. So it's not only good for the government or for the environment, but it's also good for the economic development, it's good for bringing more people that want to live, work, and play here. So there's some great benefits there. Mm -hmm. So it really benefits everybody in an ideal world in the society. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And it, it, it sustains us in every sense of the word. Yeah. yeah. And you can't have a sustainable economy without having a sustainable way that that economy interacts with the earth. Now I know Minneapolis literally has been called a champion of sustainability. Mm -hmm. Just recently. So we are, are among the best. Now, but you've, and you've been in your job for some time. Are you, a, are you an unusual job title person? Am I an unusual person, Joan? Is no, that no, what you no. <laughs> Just the job. <laughs> yeah, um, actually, no. You know, most major cities in the United States and Canada have sustainability officers. Mm -hmm. In fact, I'm part of a network of 100 of us throughout the country, and we share stories and try to help each other along. So I think most big cities realize that thinking about this three, the social equity, the environment, and the economic development together is something that's really important. Mm -hmm. Well now, I know you brought along with you the Climate Action Plan, which I guess sort of for most of us when we think about uh, sustainability, we think about what's happening to our environment. And so Climate Action Plan, which is now two years old? Right, right. So the Minneapolis Climate Action Plan, and it's on our website, was really all about the city council's um, goal of saying, hey, we want to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions 30% by 2025. And um, we put together this plan with a whole bunch of stakeholders over a year and a half process to say, well, what's it going to take to meet those directions, meet those goals? And so we came up with a really great plan that talks about how we're going to reduce our energy, clean, use cleaner energy, um, get people out of vehicles, use more bikes, more buses, um, recycle more. So we're, we're making progress on it. And I think this document was really important in letting policymakers know where we stand and how we can make future decisions. And it's driving a lot of other change, including our relationships with our natural gas and our electricity utilities. Mm -hmm. Well, now that is something that's really exciting. Yes. So this is another first for Minnesota, for Minneapolis, this right? This is a first for the country. Yes. 
Okay. You want to tell us a little bit what, what this sure. is? So back in October, uh, the, the city and uh, Excel and Centerpoint signed this first in the nation clean energy partnership. Uh, and the idea behind it is that the, the utilities in the city are going to sit at the same table uh, and work together to meet some of the city's climate goals uh, and, and some of our other goals about having affordable, reliable, uh, locally generated uh, sources of, of energy, uh, both electricity and natural gas. Now this was in response partially to a movement by some people to say that we mm -hmm. should build our own power system or energy system. Yes, that's right. Um, and so the, that sort of pushed things in toward negotiations. Yes, the Minneapolis Energy Options Campaign and, and Community Power, which they've sort of morphed into, helped really start this conversation uh, at the city level. Um, and we had a, a very big sort of contentious conversation uh, in 2013, but that brought us to the point where, where then we were able to sit down with the utilities as we negotiated the franchise agreement this year uh, and, and get to this place where we're, we're, we've decided to, to work together to meet our goals. Uh, one of the things that could maybe come out of this is uh, one of the first functional uh, rental uh, and multifamily energy efficiency um, programs that, that anybody has ever built anywhere. Um, it's, it's something that people know is really hard to do. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's difficult to do because you have split incentives between the landlord and the utility bill payer, the, the renter. Uh, and so how do, we, how do we solve that problem? So that's one of the first things that we're going to be working on. To me, it's quite amazing the fact that, that people who don't always have the same interests, the energy companies in the city, mm -hmm. the consumers, are able to put together this agreement. Yeah. And that's why I guess it's so unique. It's a huge opportunity. Yeah. Yeah, and it, you know, a lot of credit goes to the utilities for mm -hmm. sitting down and negotiating with us and thinking about what we, and I'm, when I'm talking about we, I mean all the residents in the city and the business community, because lots of people have said we want a different utility system. So um, a lot of credit goes to them too of saying, how do we do this? Can we meet these goals? And for taking the courage to do it. So basically what this means then is that they are, the energy companies, uh, Excel and Centerpoint, they are buying into the need to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. I mean, they're going to be working with the mm -hmm. city. Yes. To, to meet those goals, yes. right, uh, and it and it dovetails nicely with some of the goals that they already face, yeah. uh, or, or or some of the the requirements that they're getting from the state. So uh, the renewable energy standard, uh, the conservation improvement program, uh, working with Minneapolis to, for instance, try to to have multifamily and rental housing also participate in energy efficiency programs helps them meet goals that they already have. So that's it's really a win-win. It is, uh, or it can be. Yes. Now, how will the city interface with the two uh, um, companies? Go ahead. So um, under the Clean Energy Partnership, and this is really geeky, so I apologize if we're going too far in the weeds here, um, there's going to be a board, and it's made up of eight people. So there'll be four people from the city, the mayor, two council members, and the city coordinator, and then the utilities, Excel Energy, will have two high-level um, people on it, and so will Centerpoint Energy, our natural gas. And the, f and the eight will meet at least quarterly to hash out these issues, and the staff in the meantime will be um, not only working together, but also implementing the programs and directions that the board has set. And there'll be this advisory committee too, made up of the community that will be adding input and recommendations. Once a year, we're gonna try to have an annual report and report back to the community on how well it's working um, and show measurements of success and things like that. Now it has a five year, it's a five year contract. The franchise, yes. So then in five years we can renegotiate, and figure out how it worked and yeah. yeah. Hopefully. I think everyone is hopeful that this is going to work, yeah. um, but we also understand that it hasn't really been tried before. Uh, and, and so I'm, I'm particularly hopeful that, that we can actually get to the point where working alongside the utilities, we can meet some of our, our goals that we've laid out. And if it turns out not to be the case, then we'll have to try to figure out what exactly. our other options are. Mm -hmm. Well, let's move to something completely different, and that is biking. And I know that you, Robin, are yeah. a big in biker. In fact, you said you would have biked here tonight. Yes, but I have a flat. A flat tire. That's right. So I walked. But how, what I, I was really curious, there's something, because of the weather on this particular day when it's so cold, mm -hmm. protected bikeways. Mm -hmm. Would that be helpful in the wintertime? It would be helpful. And what is a protected bikeway? It would be helpful in the wintertime. It would be helpful all times of year, I think. Uh, a protected bikeway is, is a, it, 
more than just a bike lane. It's, it's a dedicated space like a bike lane, but then with a physical barrier between the bicyclist and moving cars. Mm. Um, now that physical barrier can be as simple as just a little plastic bollard, or it can be a curb, uh, or it can be parked cars. We can move the parked cars to the other side of, of the, oh, of the bike lane. Oh, I that has been done already. On, on some... First Avenue yeah. in downtown. And, and several of these are actually going to be built this year. Washington Avenue uh, in downtown is going to have a protected bike lane on it. One was actually just opened on 36th Street West uh, down in, in uh, Lisa Bender's ward in, in Ward 10 um, this year. Uh, and the idea is um, I will bike anywhere. I'll bike where there is no bike lane, I'll bike all times of the I year. I won't. Um, and <laughs> what we need, if we want to increase it from just the, the, the four and a half percent of people who are biking today mm -hmm. to something more like what they have in Copenhagen, where, where a third of trips uh, are, are made by bike, um, is we need to build infrastructure that feels comfortable to everybody, every kind of person. Uh, mm -hmm. including you. Who's out there uh, biking. That's right. So so when I when I think about it, I think of, you know, does this feel comfortable to me? Sure. Does it would it feel comfortable to my mom? Would mm -hmm. it feel comfortable to my sister? Would it feel comfortable to people who um, who have a little kid with them, uh, either on their own bike or in a, a trailer in the back? Mm -hmm. uh, and if we build infrastructure that feels safe to all of those kinds of people from 8 to 80, uh, then we will actually see significantly more people choosing that as a transportation option. Now you said before we started that there was some the, a winter biking conference that might come here. Yes, we're um, I'm part of a group of people who are are trying to bring the 2016 Winter Bicycling Congress uh, to the Twin Cities. Uh, I, I went to the um, Winnipeg Congress last year. If they can do it in fantastic. Winnipeg, yeah, I mean we're we are one of the best bike cities. Um, in the country, and, and when Bicycling Magazine said that we were one of the best bike cities in the country, winter was front and center. Uh, I mean, it wasn't despite our winter, it was because of it. Oh, really? Um, yes. Wow. And of course, how does that build into sustainability? What, how does it improve our quality of life? So one of the big things that, that we need to get to is we need to build a transportation system where people aren't essentially forced to use cars to get from where they are to get to where they're going. So we need functional transit systems. We need density along the, those transit systems that would, that would su support them. Uh, and we need good non-motorized options for people walking, for people on bikes, um, to, to get from where they are to where they're going. Uh, and when we build all of that all together, uh, I'm confident that we will have more people choosing to live without a second car, without a first car. Um, you know, we've, we've also allowed all of these new things like car sharing and electronic ride sharing. I mean, we're doing lots of different options to make it easier for folks to not have to and have a car. And this all works into the lowering emissions. Exactly. And air quality, improving air quality. When we look at the air quality issues in Minneapolis and the Twin Cities region, it's no longer big factories that are the pollutants. Really? It's the amount of cars That's right. and trucks out there. Those are the major sources of pollution that we're most concerned about. So we've got to figure out a way to clean up those cars and also to have few of them out there. Just fewer on the road. Yeah. And it's also all of those options, but especially the non-motorized options like biking and walking, are better for our health as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's sustainable in lots of different ways. That's kind of one of the themes of sustainability is that when you, when you do one thing right, you can have multiple co-benefits. Well, like today, I took the bus. Yeah, I usually bus to work, and it's five miles. And today, I didn't have to go and worry about the car starting. I didn't have to warm up the car. I just walked a half a block and caught the bus, and it was already warm. So what's not to love? Standing there waiting for the bus was always the part that I didn't <laughs> like. But of course, if you time it right. They have so many great apps now that you can have on your smartphone so you know when the bus is coming. It's gotten a lot easier. And you do have, it's convenient for you to do that. You don't have yeah. to transfer? That's it. I got a straight shot. Um, right downtown so and Minneapolis bus system is pretty good in most parts of the city we definitely need to know do improvements in other parts but yeah now has the uh, the t two new two light rail lines has that made a difference in, in a number of people that are maybe biking to a place where they can get on the train uh, I think so I mean it's made a big difference to me uh, and and to folks who live down in sort of the Longfellow area in, in southeast Minneapolis um, I, I think uh, 
it's a little early to tell with the green line. It just came online this mm -hmm. year. Um, but it has already sparked a lot of conversations about um, new development. So like, for instance, in, in Prospect Park that Cam represents, right. there's a lot of interest in, in a lot of new housing and a lot of new jobs right there on the green line. Um, and, and the idea is that people will be able to get to those houses and to those, those um, jobs without necessarily having to use cars for that. Well, I know one of the other things that we talked about back when the League did their program on sustainability was the, the issue of food in the city mm. and how people could get good food. And I know you've done a lot of work on that, so can you tell us a little bit about what's happening? I will, and I brought some facts. <laughs> First off, I, I think one of the important things to know about sustainability is that we're a really small office, Joan. We're just three people. Mm -hmm. And so when we're talking about the city, I'm not talking about what I've done. I think what makes Minneapolis sustainable is the fact that we have so many different departments and policy makers and residents and businesses all concerned about this. So when I'm, we're talking about this, I'm not claiming credit for any of it. But on food, listen to this. <laughs> In 2014, we had 29 farmers markets. We have over 243 community gardens. We had 70 food trucks. And a lot of those food trucks are entrepreneurs and they're really interested in local food. Um, we have one mobile grocery store. We have 15 urban farms. We have people that are growing and raising and selling food that was um, produced in the city. There are 275 chicken um, <laughs> coops. And we chicken have coops, not just chickens. Yeah, clocks, yeah, otherwise. yeah, yeah. And then we have 50 um, hives, beehives in the city. So it's a thriving. People are really interested. I think if. I think when we leave, people are always like, oh, Minneapolis, you guys are all such foodies. And I think we forget what a great food system we have here. Well, now, how does this? How did this spring up? I mean, I, I can't imagine that all of a sudden everybody decided they wanted to have chickens in the backyard. Why? What, what made people get so into food? What do you think? I have no idea. I mean, I, I, I guess I, I'm thinking that it must be a way to save money, get back to your roots, Mm -hmm. All kinds of things like that. I think people are interested in where their food comes from and concerned. Um, I think you're right that everybody's interested in health. I think it's fun. Um, I think there's a lot of gardeners out there. I think healthy food, I think people want to know where their food comes from. There's been a lot of um, better understanding on how bad food can be for you, certain types of food, mm -hmm. and the idea of eating more fruits and vegetables and what does that mean. It's really fun to go out with young kids who don't know where carrots come from mm -hmm. and watch them grow the carrots and then like just die. They can't wait any longer and so they dig up Pull the up. carrots to see what's underneath. And the same thing with potatoes. They had no idea potatoes grew under the ground. Um, and that hopefully stuff like that makes them want to eat carrots and potatoes more. Now, I know that when we've talked about this a couple of years ago, they were, some of the neighbors were not real excited about having uh, chickens or other animals, I suppose bees too, and they also didn't like the idea of maybe hoop houses and things like that. So how, how, does that, how is it going these days? Well, so um, over the last few years, since the Homegrown Minneapolis Initiative started, we've, we've done lots of different ordinance and policy changes. Um, and uh, the, the, probably the biggest one was the one that you were talking about, allowing people to grow food commercially in Minneapolis for the first time since the 1960s. Uh, and uh, there were some folks who had concerns. We're not really hearing any complaints. Uh, and in fact, this year, uh, we, we kind of loosened those rules up again. We, we made it so that urban farmers can have farm stands more days of the year. Um, and uh, we made it a little bit easier for people to have beehives in their backyard. Uh, and, and allowing, for instance, the mobile grocery store that Gail was talking about. Um, that was not something that was really allowed before this year. Um, that's, that's an ordinance that we just recently passed. Um, so there's, I would say, a lot of interest in um, it, changing the city's policies to make it easier for people to get, uh, to get growing, mm -hmm. uh, to, to have uh, chickens and bees, um, and, and to um, get their hands on fresh, healthy foods. Uh, another of the things that we did this year was to, to uh, um, we changed the requirements for grocery stores to up the standards of healthy foods that they have to carry if they're going to be carrying um, uh, government um, mm -hmm. nutrition assistance programs like EDT. So, uh, uh, but you know, as I was saying before we started, the, the question really was, the grocers were saying, yeah, but I have to throw those things out because nobody is buying mm -hmm. the fresh food. 
And so one of the problems that we've that, that you find all over the place in sustainability is that we have built certain cultural norms, and we have to uh, look at those and understand that we can change them, and then actually act to change them. And one of those norms is people. Uh, there are there are grocery store owners who say, "I would love to sell more carrots if people would come in and buy them," and people from the nearby community who say, "I'd love to go buy some carrots, but I can't get them there." So somebody has to step in in the middle and say, y "Yes." We'll, we'll create the demand, and yes, we'll create the supply. We, we have to put the two together. But now, I guess I'm going to be the devil's advocate and say, mm -hmm. but people really, you know, a lot of people have mac and cheese because it's cheap and quick. Mm -hmm. And and that's important because but you come not, home from work. And it's not naturally cheap and quick. It's <laughs> cheap and quick because we have decided for it to be cheap and quick. Um, and we've decided, we, we, uh, we've decided anyway as a society that that's what cheap food is going to be. Mm -hmm. We can make other decisions about, about But people are, I guess, it's sort of what you were saying before. How, how are you teaching people that macaroni and cheese is not necessarily the way to go? You know, it's just amazing. And I'd really like to uh, encourage you to have the Minneapolis Public School, their oh, nutrition yes. director, come and speak about all the work that the school system is doing to get kids to eat healthy food because they a lot of them haven't had a lot of it so their taste buds aren't used to it you know they want tater tots and french fries and pizza and he is going to such great lengths to test out foods and make good food healthy food exciting to children because you've got to start young well and of course i read the recent story and i can't remember where it was saying they're throwing out a lot more food than they used to because kids refuse to eat the vegetables so i mean you I am not so sure them. in the public schools if that's true they've mm -hmm. been really um very systematic about checking and watching the food waste but you're right food waste in this country is a big deal and it's not just fruits and vegetables it's all sorts of food waste mm -hmm. 40 i think they say something like 40 percent of food you know is thrown away which is a shame so i uh the question really is how do you change people's tastes yeah you know, I think you're right, though. It's not just access to food. People have to learn how to cook. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of work going on in terms of, you know, what are recipes with five, um, five ingredients, ingredients or less? less. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> That's what I like. Um, there's a lot of cooking classes out there for whether you're in high school. There's some really interesting college courses I've gone and spoken at, um, working with um, food shelves in having cooking demonstrations there at food markets, at, at farmers markets having demonstrations. Yeah, I think there's this whole lost culture of the slow food movement and but how you know, to do again, it. I mean, I think this is, it always, the, this always seems to me that it's just for the affluent people who have the time hmm. to do these things. And the people who, who are working, you know, two jobs and all these kinds of things, they just don't have time to do these things. So it would be nice. I'm sure they might like to do it too, but they have to do something that's inexpensive and quick. And so. But when we had the public hearing on the on the grocery store staple food ordinance, um, a lot of the folks who testified, uh, a lot of the, the just residents who testified, were folks from North Minneapolis who who see every day that they don't have the same kind of access to to healthy fruits and vegetables that people in other neighborhoods do and they said that's not that's not right it sh it shouldn't be easier in my neighborhood to find a strawberry flavored little cigar than it is to find a strawberry that's um, true and and we we also had at that hearing a um a young woman from the Minneapolis public schools i think she's maybe in 11th grade at this point um and she talked about the transition among her peer group from no one really wanting to touch the, the, the food and, and people eating things like pizza and, and hamburgers every day for lunch to um, a complete difference in the, in the way that her peers are eating because of the work that Bertrand Weber has, has so, been so doing. So things, that, that's a healthy sign. Well, we're talking about food and we haven't talked at all about recycling. And I know there's been some changes mm -hmm. in that too. Mm -hmm. Hasn't it been exciting? So last year, 2014, we completed the rollout of the single sort recycling program. A wonderful thing. A yes. wonderful thing. And that's where um, all single family or one through four unit um, residential homes got this big blue bin. And it was fun to deliver it. It was on Facebook and everybody was really pleased. So now you don't have to sort out your cans and glass and plastics. You just throw it all in there. Um, and, and the recycling rate has gone up because say, of that. So yeah. that was, I mean, it's it's fun because it's easier for folks. Mm -hmm. But the real reason to do it is we uh, 
we wanted to see more of the recyclable material get recycled rather than ending up in the garbage burner downtown. Well, now we're looking ahead to 2015. So doing so many things right, what, what are your goals for 2015? Well, one of it is we're going to start rolling out the source separate organics program for residents. So we want to be able to offer to residents um, that they can compost, put it in another bin and we'll collect it and we're going to make compost out of your food waste and your non-recyclable paper. So we're going to start in 2015 and end in 2016 and rolling out that program. Mm -hmm. That'll be really fun. And that's part of a larger zero waste plan mm -hmm. or towards zero waste plan uh, that will be worked on and uh, my hope is adopted. Uh, in 2015. Another big plan that I care a lot about is the, the protected bike waste plan for the 30 miles that we plan to, to build. By, 30, mi yes, 30 miles? 30 miles by 2020. Um, and uh, that plan will be adopted, I hope, sometime first quarter this year. Uh, and then we're, we're going to start building a bunch of them. I, the last I heard is something like seven miles uh, just over the course of this year and next. Now, I know one of the things that eventually you want to get to be is a zero waste city. That's right. How long will that take and is it possible? Hmm. You know, I think um, it's a visionary goal and I think everybody understands that because it isn't, you know, we'll never be completely no. zero waste. But when you look at other cities that have set that challenge for themselves, it helps drive policy changes and it gets people excited about that. It's hard to get excited about garbage, <laughs> you know, and, but it really helps create that vision and everybody working together as to what's our ultimate goal here. So I think that there's room for improvement in our recycling rate, both for homeowners, but also for properties. I mean, commercial recycling is mandated in the city, but it's really hard to see how it's working. Mm -hmm. um, and the state just mandated it too. And and so I think if we're all working together and I think the business community knows that their employees want to work someplace that you know has recycling and that cares about the environment and people want to shop in those kind of places. So there's a lot of synergies coming together on this. So that it is a it is a nearly achievable goal in the future. We've got we've got a long way to go, but we've got some great opportunity. Whether we ever actually get to zero or not, it's good to have zero out there as our end goal. It's a, it's and to remember goal. that waste isn't natural, it's it's a choice that we make. We, we make the choice to make things that can be nothing but waste when we're done with them. Well, this is, I hope, giving you some ideas about ways that you can save and be more uh, sustainable in your own lifestyle. And obviously, Minneapolis has some great plans about how they're going to be sustainable in the future. Now, we've got the website up on the screen so that you can find out what Minneapolis is doing and we have Cam, uh, we have uh, Robin's blog so you can contact him if you're interested or read what he has to say. So thanks for tuning in tonight and learning more about Sustainable Minneapolis. This is Joan Higginbotham for the League of Women Voters of Minneapolis saying good night and join us again.